Hello, welcome to another edition of Hit the Lights podcast. I've got a very special guest with me today. I've got Gary Parker. How are you? I'm very warm, uh, Gary. Uh, it's, yeah. it's about 35 degrees. More than that, I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm similarly toasty at the moment. Um, sweat dripping down the forehead. Um, but yeah, no, uh, very much looking forward to having a, having a chat with you. Yeah, and likewise. So, for the listeners at home, would you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself and your journey into the world of electrics? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I'm Gary Parker. I'm the Senior Technical Manager over at uh, the ECA, the uh, Electrical Contractors Association, and I've been, unfortunately, around longer than I care to think now. I, I do seem to recall it was only just a few years ago I was the, the young whippersnapper and being cheeky to my bosses. Um, now I've got more grey hairs than they probably have, which is a bit of a shame. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, I would, would you like me to sort of give you a, a run through with my background? Yeah, no, de- yeah, definitely. I mean, um, did you come in through an apprenticeship route and the companies you work for, etc.? Yeah, so I, I, I'm from the northeast originally. I'm uh, from just outside Middlesbrough, and when I left school, it was universities weren't really a massive option. Um, it was not an awful lot to do. It was a great amount of employment. Um, I, I tried going to college for a year to do computing, but it, I didn't really get on with that. And I fancied trying to earn some money. And one aspect of my college course I enjoyed was fiber optics um, and fiber optic installations. So I asked the tutor how best to get involved with this because there was wonderful rumours of earning fortunes in a very short space of time. And he suggested getting an electrical apprenticeship. Um, so I did not never touched a fibre optic cable in the next 25 years. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, yeah, I found an apprenticeship and uh, unfortunately got made redundant after a week uh, for my first company that went bankrupt. Um, but I went through an organisation called JCL who were brilliant and sorted me a, a, a second company. Um, I'm not sure they're around any more now. They were at the time called Eve Graham. Um, I think they used to be called Graham Brothers uh, and part of a, a larger group and it was a it was brilliant. I had a wonderful apprenticeship. I had a wonderful time. Uh, I'm still in touch now with some of the guys from there and the variety of work was incredible. We, we would work all over the country, a little bit abroad, um, ranging from hotels, hospitals, stadiums to we didn't do an awful lot of domestic, if anything, frankly. Uh, but it was it was all generally big stuff, heavy industry, British Steel, ICIs. Uh, it was a it was a fantastic learning experience to be sent all over the country, doing all sorts of different things with lots of interesting, fun, and very skilled people. No, no, I mean that sounds sounds very broad. And um, where where did you um, end up developing yourself? Then you said obviously that. Um, there weren't many educational opportunities at that time. How, how did you further yourself in that regard? Um, I, I asked my employer at the time if they would like to sponsor me to go off and do a HNC, and they, they weren't overly keen on it, but uh, they did allow me to go and do an ONC, an Ordinary National Certificate. Uh, unfortunately, they they didn't give me uh, any money for it, so I had to take a bit of a pay cut on that one. But it, it it changed how I looked at training and qualifications. I um, I left school with probably dis- slightly disappointing quals. Um, but I started enjoying it. And after I finished my apprenticeship and worked for a while, I moved um, towards London and started working on uh, different projects for different firms, subcontracting at times, employed at times. Um, even more people went through some agencies as a as an electrician, and I ended up uh, eventually working for a firm who did work for water treatment sites. Um, stayed there for oh many years, um, and then I moved off to uh, a company called the British Board of Agrimont and started undertaking audits and assessments. And at the same time, I did some part time work in a college, and that's where I really started enjoying 
training and education more so because it, it showed me a different path and as much as I enjoyed my apprenticeship massively it's a hard job it really is a hard job I've got all the sympathy in the world for anybody who's working on train trunking and conduit in minus 20 degrees in the middle of winter it's, it's terribly tough I fancied doing a bit of a change so I did some lecturing and tutoring um, and auditing and then I started getting some uh, urges to do some other qualifications and additional training as well. In terms of the the training, and what, what um, additional insight did that give you that you um, probably didn't necessarily have prior? I, I thought I was quite a good tutor at college. Uh, we, were, we were teaching adult trainees. Uh, we would do all the apprenticeship type courses. And I always thought I was quite good because I could give my experience and background and um, I suppose advice I guess but it's a very different skill set teaching as opposed to knowing and doing the teach training course has really made me think about how you deliver and how you get things across and I, I did a, a, a part-time business management degree at the time because I wanted to learn how business works and how people work it, you know it's, it's very easy being uh on a site and given a drawing and told to put something from here to there and it's straightforward but to understand how to get the best out of people is a very different skill and it's not always taught in colleges and now we see with ECA and our members it's it's very different being a, an electrician to being a, a business owner. And uh, it's, it's probably something that's lacking throughout the industry. Mm. Did you find doing the the audit the audits also um, opened your eyes in a different way? Yeah. I, I, we had to undertake lots of different types of audits and um, it, it helped me understand how I thought, which sounds a bit silly, but um, I realise I'm quite logical and process driven. I, I like to have a list of things, I like to go through a list, and that showed me how best to plan and manage myself, really. Um, we did the, uh, the BSI auditing course, and just the, the skill set of asking questions and different types of questions and just trying to tease information out from people. It, it was um, it was a long time ago now. I've probably forgotten quite a lot of it, but it was very interesting, very interesting. And it certainly, I think it made me better at my job now. Hmm. Were, were they prominent, uh, predominantly safety-related audits or um, alter, alternative ones? Uh, it was mainly for electrical contractors, so I started working with a company called, at the time, Alexa, um, who domestic contractors would apply to. Uh, so we'd go out and undertake the audits. Uh, Alexa was a brand new firm at the time, so I was fortunate to be able to help shape it. Um, ECA bought Alexa in, I think it was 2007, and then uh, I came and moved over to ECA and we carried on doing the domestic and the commercial industrial audits for ECA at the time under um, what we had as a, a certification body. Right, okay. So so it's it's a part of the, the membership elements of, of auditing. Right, yeah, yeah, okay. Right, sorry, yeah, I'll follow you now. Um, in, so in terms of your career then, so you like you kind of alluded that you, you with Alexa, it, it, it evolved into the ECA um, how, how did your role in the ECA develop? Uh, I I really enjoyed the audits and the uh, assessments of members, and it was great fun. Uh, there were some really good guys to go and see, some really good guys to work with as well. But after a while, I found I was getting a little bit, um, I wouldn't say bored, but not as enthused as I could have been. And I started asking but other things. And uh, my my boss at the time, a guy called Steve, 
it was great. Really, uh, really encouraging and said, yeah, no worries. We can work with you and try and develop you and we'll get you involved in the, the running of the schemes and the management and the paperwork and everything. And I forget the, the range of different job titles I had, but, uh, I, I suppose to give it a simple phrase, I've kind of moved off the tools and into the office kind of thing and would uh, help with the running of the audits um, and the back office side and the, the admin and the paperwork and everything that went with it. So it was a, it was a slightly different uh, different take on him. I, I cheekily asked if you fancied paying for me to do a HNC because 10 years ago somebody said no and they, they said yes. So I went back to college and started doing some higher education and I loved it. Did you did you take it any further than the HNC? Did you move on to uh, the D? Uh, yeah, I, um, I I think the phrase we have up north is shy bands getting out. And I thought, well, he said yes to this, or so I'll ask about <laughs> the HND, and uh, he said yes to that. And then, then I asked about the degree, and uh, I couldn't believe my luck when he said yes to that as well. So that was great. And uh, then I said, well, you we might as well spend a bit more money and do a master's and uh, I wasn't expecting anything back on that one but they <laughs> said yes again so I've managed to to progress from failing a geography exam at school at 15, 16 to, um, to getting a master's uh, degree which I, I can't explain just how pleased and proud I am to, to say that it was fantastic really interesting really good fun and uh, it's something I would advocate anybody look at doing if they uh, if they've got the, the will and the desire. No, definitely, yeah, no, it's highly highly commendable, isn't it? Do, do you think it? What what at a uh, fundamental school level do you think um, let you down there that meant you didn't naturally progress through the educational system in the same way as maybe other university degree graduates, etc. I was probably a little bit cheeky. I don't think I had a uh, a whole-hearted interest in school. Um, I think I saw school as a as an opportunity to go and mess about with my mates. Um, the, the, there wasn't a massive amount of um, encouragement in the North East, I suppose, to, to do these sort of things and look at qualifications and further training. It, it was a, at a time where you quite often found you went on a building site or joined the army and um, thought a building site would be a bit safer. Yeah, yes, well, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well, not yeah, all. Yes. Well, no, well, I suppose, yeah, I suppose it depends on the area in which you're, you're kind of joining a construction site. Um, I suppose nowadays it's pretty safe, you'd like to think, um, mm. but most construction sites are well looked after. Um, you've, you've obviously touched on Obviously, you work for the ECA. For anyone listening who may not know who the ECA are, would, would you mind just giving a quick, I suppose it might be a difficult question to answer, but uh, uh, maybe a, a summary of who the ECA are? Yeah, yeah. Um, so ECA, the oldest trade association, and biggest trade association for electrical contractors in the UK. I, I think we've been around since 1901. And... We, we're a, a, a trade association, a group that uh, members join, and it's it's a strange concept for people who are from a commercial background to understand. But we effectively take a membership fee from each company, and the, the fee varies depending on the size. And we take that money and try and do good with it. And it's a it's a wonderful premise that at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the year, I, I don't have a massive issue on budget. I, I don't have to justify um, earning money. I don't create or uh, generate any income. What I have to do is provide services and goods to our members. And if I can spend a bit of money and do something good, my uh, my boss is usually very happy with that. So it's a it's a it's a strange role for those who are from the commercial side of the world. But it's a it's a very rewarding area to to get to the end of the week and think, probably helps somebody do something good. I've 
try to solve a problem or try to resolve a, a, a conflict. Um, mm. And our members are very varied, so small, small traders up to multinationals, I think. The, the total membership turnover is something around about six, six and a half billion annually. So there's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of companies out there and there's a, a lot of support we do and even through things like COVID. It was very rewarding just to try and help out companies and individuals and, uh, uh, and get some hopefully good feedback. So we're, 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 we're not a business, we're not a charity, we're, we're a trade association which sort of sits somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I think there's probably a, a clear distinction as well that you're not a competent person scheme either. Correct. Yeah, we um, we're, we're we're a trade association, we're a membership body. We we do audit our members, we do um, assess them to make sure that they are suitable. We we quite strict on what and who uh, we allow in, but we are a trade association. We're not a certification body. We're, we're not um, an ICEIC. For instance, yeah, no, exactly. So, as part of your role, then, obviously, you, you you mentioned that you're you're delivering for for members. I believe you're you've been touring, doing the ECA Roadshow at the moment. Could you tell me a, a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So, um, our members are quite hungry for information, and one of the things we try and do is support them by delivering that. Um, Pre-COVID, it was always live event. We'd go out and see them, well, we, you know, a structure of branches and regions. Um, during COVID, it was all uh, digital, electronic events, and now it's a little bit of a mixture of both. So with the release of the 18th edition earlier on this year, we decided now that the government restrictions on COVID and the likes have been massively reduced to go back out and see the members. So we did a, I think a series of seven or eight road shows across, uh, UK and Wales and then a few smaller ones in, uh, Isle of Man and Northern Ireland and presented to, oh, it must have been a couple of thousand, uh, companies out there. The, the major changes, the major developments and everything that we think would impact our members. Yeah, definitely. So the, the, the key areas of the country that you've hit is that because you've got the, if I'm understanding it right, the ECA, like the membership areas, is that kind of where you've tried to hit the, the markers to give everybody an opportunity? Is that right? Yeah, we, we, when we were planning the road shows, we had a recollection of something we did in 2018, same sort of concept, um, an 18th edition road show, and we tried to do it Similar but slightly different. Uh, so not to go to the same place over and over again. Um, so for instance, we went to Swansea this time. Previously we went to Cardiff just to try and uh, get to as many people as we possibly could. So we divided the country up and tried to get uh, out to as many areas as we physically could. Obviously you can't go to everywhere and you can't um, get to every single individual but uh, we did ask our members to to come out and travel to see us and bless them they, they, they really did came out in droves yeah no if you've had, obviously you said uh, you've had a few thousand uh, overall the the whole road show has been successful it's been brilliant uh the, the the feedback we got was um was, was fantastic uh I, I don't know whether it was uh partially down to people being locked up for two years but to, to get back out and talk to people and explain the changes and give them some information. And also just from a, a, a team point of view, myself and uh, my colleagues, we have barely seen each other in real life for the last two years. So it was nice to go out and speak to those guys. Some of them are slightly newer and uh, fresher. So we got, got a chance to, to have a chat uh, during the events, after the events, before the events. And, uh, it was, it was a really good, good event. And we invited people from outside of the business and people, people from different departments. And it was, uh, it came back to the overall very positive. No, that, that sounds really good. The, um, what, what were some of the, the key talking points that you were delivering as part of the, the talks? It was all about 
the well, mostly about the changes to the 18th edition and how it would impact our members going forward. We also uh, invited guest speakers from uh, from other organisations. Uh, we had Signify and um, Signify Phillips uh, come out to do something, and Aco for the small clowns, just to get uh, get a different voice on stage. We we touched on um, mental and physical health as well, and also uh, a little bit of uh, benefits uh, that some of our members probably don't know that we've got access to. But the, the vast majority of it was, was on the key changes to the 18th edition for the majority of, uh, of the membership. Right, okay. Were, were there, I suppose you were focusing on potentially like AFGDs and developments in the industry and, and the regulations in that regard? Yeah, so we, um, we, we structured the presentation in the, the layout of the book. So we went through each part and each chapter as best we can. So focused on AFDDs, uh, surge protection devices, bonding, certification, uh, paperwork, and a, a, a big section on uh, prosumer installations and uh, energy efficiency as well. Yeah, no doubt. I, I mean, having spent so much time delivering um, those talks, what, what's your thoughts on what the next amendment may hold, whether that's Amendment 3 or even maybe going as far as calling it the 19th? Um, at the moment, I don't think anybody can really say it. Um, there's, there's, there's typically about three years between amendments, um, and although the committees are working on Amendment 3 at the moment, it's still a lot of hangover from the Amendment 2 stuff that wasn't quite implemented. I imagine we'll see more development in the um, in the energy efficiency side, the consumer side, a bit more information coming out. Things like um, electrical energy storage systems, batteries uh, are becoming far more commonplace. So I would imagine there'll be some some developments on that. But no, I'd be very surprised if if things stay exactly the same for too long. You know, the, the advance of technology and half fault detection devices, as you say, is uh, is moving along, we might see uh, better use of those products as well. How are the uh, ECA kind of moving along that for its members um, in terms of dealing with the updates in technology? How, how do you like communicate that to your members? Oh, we have a few different mechanisms. We send out uh, an email to all members every fortnight, um, which goes out to our nominated reps, I think, and in the businesses. We got a quarterly physical magazine, a paper magazine that we still provide for, for members, which is published and sent out. We've got an online version of the magazine, which is a lot more uh, reactive. We can put an article, a bit of information on there every um, every day if we want to. Um, one of the key areas is, uh, is our internal technical committee, which is uh, a committee made up of members who volunteer their time and knowledge and experience and uh, sit in a room, be it virtually or physically, and meet four or five times a year, talk about any issues that the, the membership have, and that gives us a, a steer within ECA of what to do uh, for the members. And then we will take it straight from the horse's mouth and hopefully try and do something to help and then give them information which they can feed off to their Teams as well. I don't know. It, it sounds um, like obviously you're you're keeping abreast of of everything with uh, with regards to keeping your members up to date. We try to. Um, I think a bit like anything, you you get so many emails and so many bits of information. It's quite easy to miss them, and quite often they'll they'll end up going to the wrong person or the the junk box, and sometimes things will get missed, but. Generally, we, we do try, and if uh, if members ever want to contact us, they can either speak to us, our legal department, our HR department. Uh, we've got good relationship with hopefully their regional managers from uh, from ECA, so we we try to to do that. We also have um, our the way we structure ourselves is through multiple regions throughout the country, and then multiple branches within those regions, and we. 
take all our notes and minutes and share them amongst uh, anybody who comes to those meetings. Is is there uh, regular opportunities and, like you say, meetings for for all the members to kind of gather and and share? Yeah, so I, I, I forget exactly. It might be 12 regions I think we have throughout the UK, so Northern Ireland, Isle of Man, and the North East, North West, South East, South West, Greater London, East, West Midlands and the likes. Um, each of those geographic regions is uh, is looked after by a regional manager who knows each member in that area, hopefully, and is in general contact with them uh, whenever they need to. Uh, they'll have a, each region has a, a an annual meeting with all members invited and each region is then subdivided into little branches where uh, they'll have um, four or five meetings a year amongst the, the branches and that's how we try and encourage members to be involved in the association and uh, become part of it and start being on, um, on the branch committees, regional committees, the national committees and then eventually become uh, part of council and become ECA president. Right, yeah, um, there's definitely um, the support networks that they've got there uh, as a membership um, you would anticipate. We hope so. Uh, having been doing it for 120 odd years, we should be getting good at it. <laughs> is, is, is there a, um, I suppose, maybe off the, off the top of your head, maybe this might be an unfair question, but just what the, the qualification criteria to become a member is? Yeah, it's, it's not an unfair question at all. Um, well, we've got different types of memberships. Um, our typical is the uh, contracting members, and those would have to meet the requirements of a thing called the EAS, the Electrotechnical Assessment Specification, uh, for the qualified supervisor, which is summing it up, a, a time served electrician with an AM2, an 18th edition, and some inspection and testing qualifications. Um, that that would be the, the typical route. But we've also got uh, specifier members, people who don't actually do work, but specify members to do work. So we've got well, several police forces and members um, through that route. We've got consultants um, who are members don't, I guess, say, do any physical work, but design. We've got educational associates. We've got um, colleges and schools and training centres who are members uh, through that. And there's a myriad of different ways that you can be involved with ECA and, uh, and, and tap into our network and share our information. Sounds really positive. One, one thing I kind of want, wanted to ask you, uh, what, what do you enjoy most about the electrical industry? And that, that can obviously encompass your role um, on a daily basis or as, as far as, uh, you know, something you really do enjoy about the, the sector. Um, in, in terms of my role, I, I, I like the variety. Um, Tuesday I was in Manchester talking to a, a, a large company and having a, a, a good old chin wag about issues and uh, trying to help them out and giving them some information on the 18th week before I was in Northern Ireland speaking to members over there. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in a committee meeting discussing some of the changes on the 18th. and the, Such a variety of work is, is great. Um, I, I really enjoy the support that we offer. Uh, I, I like not having a budget. Um, that's not always the most exciting part of any job, but to not have a budget and to, to be able to just go out and help members is great. And the, the lovely feeling of getting a, an email from somebody saying, oh, thanks for that. You saved me a fortune. Oh, you've, uh, you've explained that. That's brilliant. Uh, I really enjoy that. In terms of me personally, the massive variety of work that you just don't understand when you are an apprentice. I, I recall somebody in my class at college complaining that he didn't want to know about this because he works for the council and he changes street lamps. And that's fine. If that's all you're doing, if that's all you want to do. But to, to see the variety of work that people do out there from a one-bedroom flat to an oil rig to a hospital to educational establishments to military sites uh, it, it's it's unbelievable what 
just a simple thing like a switch and a cable can offer you. And the, the development of technology nowadays, an electrician isn't just somebody who goes around and puts a cable in and attaches a thing to it. The equipment you can get and the intelligence in the circuit breakers and the products you can buy, it's, it's wonderful to see it developing and to see how we're moving now to greener installations, electrification of installations, um, presuming installations and tying all this together. It's, it's a wonderful industry for anybody who's looking to, to be involved in it. Opportunities are almost boundless. And that's quite exciting. No, it definitely is. This is a fantastic time to be in the industry, um, with so much available in terms of resources as well as the developments and the fast moving nature of our industry now. It's, um, yeah, no, like you say, it's a fantastic time to be involved in it. Mm, absolutely. And the, the, the sharing of information, the understanding and working with colleagues throughout the rest of the world, it's, it's the same problems that an electrician in Germany will have to an electrician in Edinburgh. It, it's the same issues, and it's nice to try and help those guys out where we can. So it's a it's a very exciting time for the electrical contracting world, and it's full of opportunities, full of them. On on the other hand, though, I will ask you this: the what do you dislike about the industry? The race to the bottom. It, it, there's too many people who, not typically within the industry, but too many people who want a cheap job, want it done at peanuts and expect an electrician to turn up and do something for next to nothing. You know, the, the, even the, a sole trader, they've got insurance to pay, they've got fuel to pay, they've got time to pay, they've got to do things themselves outside of work and when you have clients offering peanuts for an electrical condition report and then you see the state of it the race to the bottom and the lack of quality is is frustrating that that's that's a bugbear from myself personally and probably from most of our members as well because i used to be an eca member i work for eca now and to see people being undervalued is is never nice. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say, obviously, if you, most of your members are kind of feeling that and supporting that, is that something the ECA are encouraging its members, obviously, not to do, I suppose? Uh, typically, if you end up getting into a, a battle over price, everybody loses. And, um, yeah, we, we appreciate some people have, have got tight budgets, some people have got bigger budgets, but the, there's a, there's a limit that you can, go to without actually losing money and uh, you know, part of our remit is to encourage growth within the industry and you, you can't encourage growth if you're losing money as a business so it's it's not something we, we would like to get involved in. No, yeah, I quite agree. Are you still finding that memberships are, are steady? I, I assume there's obviously quite a heavy renewal. Are, are you finding there are lots of uh, new companies entering and um, looking for membership, or are we? Are you mainly um, maintaining a, a client base, if you like to call it that, a membership base? We're we're very steady. We we sort of maintain. We we'll, um, we'll we'll lose and gain about equally. Um, we there's only so many companies out there, and although it probably isn't the best thing to say from a sales point of view. A lot of companies out there who aren't ECA members don't need to be. We we do charge per uh, or based on business turnover, and in many cases, if you're a sole trader or a very small enterprise, we're, we're not the home for you. Um, if you are looking to grow, or you've got uh, four or five guys working in the business, then we might be. Um, might be a, a useful home. You know, we've got goods and services and benefits that will uh, tick boxes for a lot of firms, but we, we tend not to go out and look for the smaller contractors. Um, they they tend to be uh, 
registered with people like NIC, IC Search, or yeah, a little bit more um, relevant to the scope that they're delivering as a business. Absolutely, and and that's perfectly fine. Perfectly happy with that. There's no nobody, not everybody wants to take on the world and grow the business and make it a multi-million dollar uh, firm. Some people are just happy being their own boss and fair play to them. Um, they probably won't be ECA members. They can be. Well, can have. Come along. But especially with recessions looming and energy crisis and the likes, we have to be realistic and say that, yes, you probably don't need us. If you're that firm, you probably don't need us. Come sure. back when you're, when you're growing and then we've got things that can help. No, I think that's a, a, a lovely message to end it on. Um, I, I do have one last question, though, um, which I ask of all my guests. Uh, what's your favourite movie? Ooh. Um, probably Shawshank Redemption. Ah, oh, it's a popular choice. Is it? Is it? <laughs> it's, it's a very... Yeah, typically, do you know what? Typically we find, certainly among the electrical community, it's either Star Wars, Shawshank... Um, there's a there's a few typical ones that kind of get get selected. So uh, I mean it's a flawless film, so I can't deny the choice. <laughs> I, I think if uh, if I mention something like Cole and the Barbarian, my wife would <laughs> string me up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, our classic Arnie's are another one as well. So that's, <laughs> you're in good good company. Ah, <laughs> uh, I think we, we I think we saw Running Man from 1987 the other night, and it was tremendous. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, well, it was something anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, um, it's been uh, lovely chatting with you, and uh, you know, thank you very much for uh, having a having a discussion with me today. Pleasure. I'm going to go and get a nice cold drink of water now, and see if I can cool down a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> lie down in the shade. <laughs> Not just yet, but maybe in a little while. But thanks ever so much for your uh, for your call, and thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no, thank you very much, and uh, thank you everyone for listening. <laughs>